Apokatastasis. It's a Greek word. Apokatastasis. You can follow along. Apokatastasis. Apokatastasis. It's not quite a tongue tangler. <laughs> Two weeks in a row now, we've been uh, faced with big words that are hardly ever, or in this case, never used in our language. Um, probably don't see them in written form, most of you, I do, but this is one word, one time, for one great purpose, and it has caused much consternation in the body of Christ. <clears throat> it's a Greek word which is found only one time in the New Testament and is never used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint. Its root, however, comes from a word meaning to restore, which is only used eight times in the New Testament, but is found 32 times in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the um, Old Testament. Willie, you have a car that's being restored, is that correct? I think so. Okay. It's supposed to be happening. Yes. Apokatastasis is used in the translation of Peter's sermon, which he gave after the healing of the lame man at the temple gate, where we read in Acts chapter 3 and verse 21, Peter was talking about Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This word, though found only once in all of the Bible, enjoyed great popularity until about the middle of the 6th century. At the middle of the 6th century, there was a synod of Constantinople, and that synod met in order to condemn the teachings of Origen, the great theologian. Sounds awful, doesn't it? How do you think the great theologian Origen felt in having his teachings condemned. Well, the truth is, he probably didn't feel anything because he'd been dead for 300 years. It's kind of strange in my way of thinking to condemn someone's teachings without having them there to defend themselves. Nonetheless, the condemnation took hold and has held majority opinion for the, about 1,500 years. However, it was never completely dead and is currently enjoying a resurgence in popularity in the body of Christ, especially in the Western church today. Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, has stirred a great controversy among believers. He was pastor of one of the fastest growing churches in America when his book was published. And then around 2012, he had to resign as pastor of Mars Hill because of some of the things that he wrote in that book. Something we should be aware of <clears throat> is the old proverb which states, where there's smoke, there's fire. And what that generally translates to in this kind of a situation is the mob is generally wrong. We need to remember that. The Eastern Church has, for the most part, maintained... The Eastern Church is the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, uh, those Orthodox churches which claim... Most of them claim Constantinople as their headquarters rather than Rome. Uh, but they're very much a part of... They came about the Catholic division. <clears throat> but they've maintained a belief in the teachings of, of, associated with this word apokatastasis or the restoration of all things. The teachings are known by a variety of monikers. The, probably the two most popular terms, maybe you've heard of either one of them, is ultimate reconciliation or universalism. Now, I, I'm not going to try to outline the concepts of that teaching um, that, that, that's contained because that, it would take too much time. We just don't have that. But if you want to know more about it, Get my book from Amazon, A Grace Primer, 
and you can learn about it. <clears throat> Peter said there's coming a time in God's economy when all will be restored. Now, the English translation that we read says that all things will be restored, but the word for things is not in the text. It is simply all will be restored. I would suggest that what we will see is an unlimited restoration of all that has been degraded in the world. Could you agree with me maybe that the entirety of creation since the fall of Adam and Eve is what he's talking about? Ever since their sin, which brought disease, death, destruction, degradation into God's creation, things have been declining from God's original creation as good. Before their fall from grace, the world was in a state of pristine purity. Now Paul tells us that will once again be the case for all creation. He says in Romans chapter 8 verses 20 to 21, For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now Peter's statement also indicates that Jesus' return will cause a restoration of all things to this pure condition. Is it possible that this is what John was referring to in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 when he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. This verse seems to indicate something different from a mere restoration. I give you that. It appears to be a complete replacement of the old with the new. However, since the Revelation is a completely symbolic book, it is possible, I would think, to see the idea of restoration contained within the idea of replacement. Now, the first indication that we have in Scripture of restoration is found in the Bible in the book of Genesis at the Garden of Eden, which is where all this stuff began. So that's a good place to find the first reference to a restoration. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, we read, He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This has been an exciting verse for me for the past 30 years, ever since I discovered what is being said here. The meaning of guard is what I see. The King James uses the word keep, to keep the way to the tree of life. What I hear most often from people is that the flaming sword is meant to keep us out of the garden and away from the tree of life. However, that's not what it says. The flaming sword is in the hands of the cherubim to make sure the way to the tree of life is preserved. It's to preserve the way. The way to the tree of life has not been lost due to Adam's sin. It has been preserved. The only way to get to the tree of life in the midst of the garden is to pass through the fire. And I'd love to talk to you about that, but time says no. We can't do it. Another time. However, the tree of life should be a familiar concept to us. It's a common phrase in the Old Testament and the Proverbs in Genesis. The Proverbs and the book of Genesis. In the New Testament, the, word, the phrase the tree of life is only found in the book of Revelation in four places. And only one of those refers to the tree in the garden, which we find in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree, eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now this was written to the church at Ephesus. Remember the, the beginning of the book, there's seven letters to seven churches. Ephesus was the first one. For those in that church who are able to overcome the problems associated with that church, they are promised to have access 
to the tree of life. So in the idea of restoration of all things, it appears that there is coming a time when all of mankind will once again have access to the tree of life, which was his original position at creation. There are other aspects of restoration which are mentioned or implied in the Bible, but I'm only going to bring up one more. However, I'm reminded right now of another place in Revelation where it talks about the tree of life being for the healing of the nations. There's a lot in that. In the same way that there will be a new heavens and a new earth, there will also be a new covenant which God makes with us. It will have no similarity to the covenant of the Jewish people. They became accustomed to a covenant that was perverted by their leadership. And the covenant that God will make will have no resemblance to that at all. As we read in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 32, it is not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. The new covenant will be different from the old in that it is no longer a contractual agreement between two parties. The old covenant was, based, was built on the basis of, if you do this, then I will do that. In order to facilitate the keeping of our end of the, end of the contract, we were told in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then he goes on to tell the people how to have those words on their heart. He continues, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you've ever seen a movie or especially like The Fiddler on the Roof uh, where the, a Jewish person goes out their door, they have this little tiny emblem of a scroll nailed to the doorpost, and they touch that on their way out. That's their symbol for uh, keeping the Old Covenant. But looking at this, how much was required on the part of the people? It was up to them to ensure that the words of God were a part of their life. They had to put out the effort. They had to talk about them. Read them, study them, memorize the words of God in the covenant. But the times of restoration is changing that. Understanding is being changed and brought to its true meaning when Jesus walked on the earth. How often did he say, you have heard it said, but I say. He was bringing change to the understanding that they had. Although Jesus brought about a greater clarity of understanding, it would seem that it is still up to the individual to learn these distinctions. However, the restoration of the covenant renders that unnecessary. And we find that in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now we've seen recently in weeks past here that it is impossible for us to measure up in our own strength to any aspect of God's requirements. Without him and his grace, we are completely undone and without hope. The result of the restoration, the glory of God returning everything to its original condition, will be that all of creation will once again know the Lord in a salvific way. Continuing in Jeremiah, and then in verse 34, it says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, 
from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Are we there yet? No, we're not at that place. Is it coming? Absolutely. And that's not an empty promise. It is something we are witnessing around the world today as people are being restored to a right relationship to the Father, free of all the rules, rigor, and regulations that most of us have had to endure. There are people coming into the things of God today beginning with an absolute freedom. Now there's much to say about what that complete restoration will look like. But I think the following verse sums it up for me, and I hope it does for you too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28 we read, When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Brothers and sisters, we are looking at a time when the fullness of the glory of God shall cover the entire earth and God will be all in all. Amen.